Hi, uh, my name is Ivan Bruckner, and um, I'm from Georgia Hospital. I'll just turn off my microphone here. I hope you hear me. Um, and um, Montreal is in Quebec, Quebec is in Canada, and today's talk is about uh, are we able to detect single copy genome of pathogens, which is of clinical relevance. And I'll start with uh, the fact that time is essential, time is of essence, as we always know, especially in the case of acute life-threatening infections. And a typical example in schools is sepsis, where from the septic shock to the dead is separating you 36 hours. And it's a um, depressing curve, which is showing that every hour counts and survival rate drops if not adequate therapy is introduced. It's not only sepsis, it's also relevant to meningitis, it's relevant to necrotizing situations, so all bacteremia, viremia, and fungalemia are of acute uh, importance. So, I guess you can be and rely on, on this touch, but uh, sometimes it's not good enough, and we want to understand and apply therapy as fast as possible. So I'll start with a series of, of examples, but before going that, I think the maturation of technology of uh, next generation sequences is such that it's we have to do it, we must do it, uh, because we are able to do it. Um, just go back one step and think about all multiplex devices which are offered now and which are claiming that they are good for the emergency situations. You will realize that when you look at the spectrum of pathogens which they are claiming they will detect, you will never have the full set of them. And you will never have the possibility to have full set of them because as we go down the lecture, you will see that it's almost impossible to put all combinations on the single panel. <clears throat> That's slowly but certainly pushing us over the fact that protocols for fast NL sequencing must evolve faster. It's already fast, as you know, it's few, few uh, less than hour library preparation and so on. <clears throat> and usually those um, next generation sequencing platforms, they end up with, uh, with uh, genome centers in the cancer centers, institutions. Uh, but we should face also the fact that due to the nature of the therapy, majority of cancer patients where the platform is based die as cell culture incubators on a non-timely detected infection, and we are not using it uh, where we can really help it. Um, so I'll start with a few um, examples which I really pick up before uh, pre uh, preparing this presentation. Uh, there are really showcases which we could do something, but we did not, and uh, some of those people did it, but too late. Um, this one is from Australia, just showing a recent jump of rotavirus from the rabbit to the human, and uh, rotavirus is one of the most uh, deadly gastroenteritis in kids. This has a happy end, but there is no classical microbiological um, test which will detect this new type of rotavirus. So we should be uh, aware that new things are emerging, uh, host, host transitions are happening from species and uh, we should be able to respond on this faster. Next example is a Spanish, uh, it's almost like a review paper, it's talking about candidemia in intensive care units and again we should be aware that the dark 50% of candidemia are blood culture negative. And as you know, you are not getting as a first, without having suspe suspicious uh, case of candidemia, you are not getting therapy in advance. It's not part of the general strategy. So every late application of the drug will result in mortality, and it's really highest in those patients 
were not treated with antifungal drug. Now, candidemia is just about 50% of all fungemia, and there is another set of, you know, uh, yeast infections, uh, fungal infections, uh, which can end up uh, tragically. Uh, China. <clears throat> um, this example is a um, nice example that we are all aware that we are having our commercial in-house flu A assays, flu B, whatever we have as a backup for respiratory panel in microbiological labs. And until the patient die, we are not disturbed, I guess. But uh, here we have a situation that China was obliged to report to the World Health Organization. And um, after the, 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 this situation, uh, they have to sequence, and it was a new variant, which is the second case now in the history, uh, from bird to the human, and this one was a fatal case. So considering dynamic from year, in, from year to year of this uh, virus, uh, it's one of the best candidates really to follow up in the case of um, heavy cases uh, in emergency. Japan. Um, honestly speaking, I don't even know before, I didn't know what is Parvomonas nigra, but it turns out that could be a um, cause of your spondylodiscitis, <laughs> your back pain. And I know usually we have arthritic back pain, uh, there are some talks about herpes-induced back pain, usually before we get sick, we get back pain. Uh, there are bacterial cases of um, streptococcus pneumonia, back pain, and so on, but it was acute back pain, and I, I don't know what pushed those this equip in Japan to sequence, but congratulations, because um, it could be really easily removed by uh, antibiotic treatment, although Avimonas micra is a typical pathogen. Uh, I don't know the resistant profile of that, and probably probably even they don't know. So we have to start recording those things. <clears throat> Korea. Um, this one is a scary case. It's a fatal case of Megleria toplari. Uh, that's uh, meningoencephalitis, uh, first time in Taiwan, but few times, uh, more than few times in the world, uh, few swimming pools were closed. When you don't fluoride it, your water, uh, it could turn out to breaks uh, <clears throat> uh, to, a, to a small epidemic. Um, I guess there is sporadic cases with immunocompromised patients. It's amoeba, which is going through your mucos, could go to gnomes, through, through, uh, through, through uh, oral cavity, and it's, uh, it's almost eating you. And 95% cases are mortal. There is no diagnostic uh, for that routine and uh, essentially every serious case which is connected with a bizarre water either from a swimming pool or from the lake uh, it's not usually a sea uh, actually it cannot live in a sea in a salt water uh, should have a chance to be diagnosed um, next slide slide is united states this is something as a warning for cancer patients and cancer stuff. Uh, the patient was a 54-year-old woman with, uh, yes, metastatic grade three carcinoma of breasts. But the point is that she didn't die for that. She died. Uh, she died really because of uh, Clostridium shelly, which is usually not usually. It's a veterinary case. There was never detected infection in humans. And once you are immunocompromised, and once you are on cancer therapy, you will be immunocompromised. You can pick up whatever is around. Can you have a multiplex panel for everything? No, you cannot. So the only way is again to go through the <clears throat> next generation sequencing technology very fast, find the pathogen, and apply possible therapy. And this is a fatal case, uh, too late. Uh, it was abdominal based, so I guess you can think about causing difficile, which there is a test for that, but if it is negative and it was negative, you don't know what's going on there. So you are really back to the hands of uh, God. Um, this case is Italy. It's a sad case and the doctor is blamed. I don't see why doctors should be blamed for those things because it's very difficult 
I don't know this particular case. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, to realize the symptoms of uh, meningitis uh, bacteria. Uh, sometimes it's masked like a flu uh, symptoms and other, other symptoms are not there. Uh, in this particular case was a two years old child and it was combination of streptococcal meningococcal meningitis. Child died, uh, forensic autopsies are obliged after that and of course lawsuit coming after that. And I guess uh, everybody can make mistakes, so we should push our hospital administrations to give us those machines so those situations of uncertainty doesn't exist. Uh, South Arabia. Mm -hmm. But in any case, missed acute appendictus presenting as necrotitis facetis. This is again a um, case which could be maybe saved. 26 year old woman. Two days history of right abdominal pain and uh, end up as um, sepsis with, uh, with the appendix uh, broken, Streptococcus aureus. Uh, so I guess if it was not operated, but uh, with a huge, uh, maybe in this case, nothing could help. But at least we would know immediately after those two days, immediately before even operation start, we would know something is wrong in the blood because at that time when she was to, uh, second day in the hospital claiming abdominal pain, the, the pathogens already start leaking into the blood and we might detect it. With the next generation sequencing, maybe even with uh, some routine techniques. Turkey. Um, fatal breakthrough infection with the Fusarium. Fusarium uh, and Diazi, again, never heard about it, but learned of it before this presentation. And uh, uh, the fact that it was fatal uh, is again scary because it was a disseminated infection. It's coming from the plant. That's even more scary. Again, immunocompromised patient. How can you put this into multiple diagnostic device? How can you put probe primers for Fusarium uh, and Diazi? There is no medical logic, medical history to do that yet. We are dying of that when we are immunocompromised. Again, next generation sequencing. Now, uh, <coughs> probably you know about this, but if you don't, that's a nice case that Molecular biology is biochemistry and next generation sequencing technology could make uh, fatal mistakes and uh, like illustrating in this uh, bridge which they tried to connect. Um, there was a Chinese group uh, reporting seronegative, um, seronegative hepatitis, uh, which is always present with parvovirus. And there was few other reports parvovirus in 99% of clinical samples. So it turns out then when you isolate uh, nucleic acids to the spin colon, spin colon is composed of silica. And the silica is coming from algae. And algae is in a sea, Pacific, I think, somewhere extracted. And algae was infected with parvovirus. So you sequence your parvovirus. So we should be really, uh, how to say, aware of minor effects of contaminations. Now we'll go uh, to the cases which could really uh, be applied even now because the number of pathogens versus human cells is in a favor of pathogens. In general, if you are picking up the site which is really a source of infection, a number of pathogen molecules are, are in excess of a human genome. So the copy number elements you're getting from the pathogen, reading pathogen genomes are highly over, uh, over numbered or over bigger number than the host in human uh, genome sequence motifs. So normal uh, number of normal, normal of white blood cells in cerebral spinal fluid is usually less than 10 <coughs> per microliters, per microliter and uh, one microliter. And uh, what we, for example, as a lab usually get is about 200 microliters, but there is no guarantee because we are last in the chain of lab analysis although we should be, I guess, somewhere up front. And what we do, we, sh we usually do like nucleic acid isolations. Uh, step in 40 minutes then, uh, we follow up also the count of uh, human cells, which is usually 30 at the level of CT values in a real-time PCR, uh, which is about 
in a total, in a human sample, we get 100 cells. We can always check out what technology got, but this is more or less normal situation. So what is abnormal situation is what is facing doctor, because abnormal situation is never clear. Uh, you can have your proteins level change a little bit, sugars level, neutrophil level, completely the formula a little bit change. Usually white blood cells up count with those infections, but essentially you are in front of labyrinth and symptoms are really not clear. And that's why you are just getting in a, in a biggest number of cases, very generalized therapy. Um, so what's possible when there is going on the infection, infection and when your cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid which will only indicate what's going on. Well, first, white blood cells are going up. They are now bigger than 10. So your QPCR signal, for uh, uh, which is RNA-CP, as a control how many cells you have will go now down. So CT values are going down. Uh, pathogen copy number per cube could vary between 1,000. And if you are 10,000 or more, you are really in trouble. But it's possible. And what's in front of you? In front of you is either viral, bacterial, or fungal infection, and that's next step to decide and focus your therapy. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. Do you remember this case? I think it was year before, two years before, I'm not sure. But the point is that there was a meningitis outbreak and uh, 300 and something cases, 24 deaths, and it was, it was part of uh, injection liquid for arthritic patients asking to remove the pain in the knee. It was corticosteroid, which was contaminated. And of course, lawsuits, multi-million dollars uh, lawsuits. And we end up with uh, really detecting very late this case. And those cases are also, this is outbreak, but those cases are happening with the fungal infections very frequently. We have to, as we know, to wait for a few days, minimum four or five days to grow. And again, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a scary case which could be resolved with next generation sequencing. Uh, <clears throat> so what's preventing us to apply it now? Actually, uh, just focus, just intellectual focus and um, additional additional push to do it because there is nothing preventing us over that. Uh, people are scared of those that the human genome is going to over represent your output and there are biochemical ways to do that to remove human signal, I mean pot signal. There are softer ways to remove the signal and, there, and uh, the only what we are left now is how to amplify efficiently the, the nucleic acid content from the clinical sample. And now we are reduced more or less to the self-priming problem, way how we prepare library. And this self-priming problem goes back to the 10 years old PCR problem when there is a possibility uh, that primers would interact with each other. Now, you have here the strategy to amplify something even without knowing what it is. We call it de novo sequencing, and that's really dependent on the input of DNA you have, so you try to maximize. So when you try to maximize that and it's, you don't know what it is, you are using uh, pseudo-random primers or totally random primers, and because of the possibility of complementarity of the three prime end, they will send they will self prime and they will uh, make uh, sort of primer dimmers. And who is um, <clears throat> really trying to do that from the industrial point of view is Rubicon Genomics. I think distributed by Sigma. They're using uh, tag based methods and they're they are mostly used by uh, in pathology for the those light tissue, which is fixed and fully fragmented and so on because they have advantage over FE29 methods, uh, advantage which uh, is not final, but uh, there is some advantage and there is of course big disadvantage. So Kyogen is using a little bit different technology, is FE29 based method. It's a, it's a DNA polymerase with huge processivity and it's extremely efficient generating uh, unbiased uh, whole 
genome sequences or close to whole genome sequences. Um, and finally, um, it's not the only, that's done, not the end of the story, but uh, I recently found out that Cygnus company licensed a new generation of P29 polymerase, which was licensed to Kyogen with the marketing uh, name single cell. Uh, this P29 polymerase has a, has a higher affinity to the template. And uh, we did some titrations, they really go down to the single cell. Uh, I don't know the limit of uh, pathogen detection. It remains to be uh, uh, find out what will be the limit of detection of smaller genomes. But uh, this is not Harry Potter movie, that's reality. And they are really coming with some um, nice stuff to address all those problems we are, we are facing in this uh, lecture. Actually, any sequencing company is trying to do the same thing, <clears throat> to adapt library preparation and to push it really directly into the clinic. Going back to the, to the, to the hospital milieu, when you ask them to, to provide you the, the sequencing instrument and you try to introduce those uh, upfront things, uh, usual comment you will get out is, we don't have a big volume of those cases. So what we should ask, we should say that uh, definitely in some cases you can save lives, speed up recovery, and invest in understanding the relation between pathogen in order to identify it. Then the other, the other answer you will get is that uh, the microbiologist may be, but depending on the type of microbiology, uh, microbiologist is that uh, <clears throat> we apply anyway universal therapy. So our therapeutic approach is anyway uh, good enough. We don't need help from you guys. Um, this is simply not true because antimicrotic drugs are not part of standard protocol for meningitis and uh, any focus therapy in general. For example, aziclovir, there's a specific antibiotic with this, uh, which each of them is sort of toxic all the way and immunizing your immune system or combination of two specific antibiotics really targeting the bug which was identified at the beginning should apply, should be accessible as soon as possible. And uh, I don't want to go into the probable reasons why this is not happening. It seems too much trouble. It's, uh, anyway, so let's go back to the technology. Uh, so on one side, you have link linker adapter techniques, which could be um, part of the next generation sequencing platforms where they attach those linkers either through the ligation, uh, Illumina to transposition. They could be part of also PCR where the five prime end you have tagged linkers. And uh, <clears throat> that's usually done after fragmentation of DNA, which is done uh, mechanically, enzymatically, chemically. The second part, which actually it's not so distinct and they should not be so divergent in when, 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 we, when we present those two different technologies also, although the ownership technologies is slightly different, is phi 29 base and uh, it's uh, actually multi displacement amplification using this phi 29 polymerase and starts with the random or pseudo random uh, primers and end up with amplifying microgram quantities of target DNA. <clears throat> so we have to choose from the beginning what we are going to do. And as I said, we are pathologists looking at the slide. You have tendency to, to, to use Rubicon. But if you are good molecular biologists, you, <laughs> you will also realize that you're not obliged to do that because uh, there are fewer reports. It's just ligation, so you have to do small end um, repairing of your DNA segments when you extract it from the, uh, from the slide. And uh, ligation will convert DNA to the longer fragment, which will be compatible with uh, FIT29. So it's really up to the personal choice. I guess uh, everybody will do what he thinks it's better skilled in. Um, then uh, fragmentation, which is part of uh, any sequencing upstream reaction. Um, it's good for tag based method, obviously, and that's that way, uh, but they are bad for feed 29 And it, at, the per, at, the, at the first moment, that looks logical and, and that's true. But where we should put really feed 29 applicability is upfront before 
fragmentation where the bias amplified DNA is done and then do the following steps further in order to identify it. Uh, just to remind you, tag-based methods, I mean, it's uh, you have a target, you have attached two type of primers, linkers, and you just amplify. This is extremely prone to, uh, to um, bias because each, uh, each amplification step will uh, depend on the previous amplification step. So somehow you are also, unfortunately, amplifying bias. I'm not saying that there is no bias in P29 amplification, again, especially where there is, um, where there is a low material input, but uh, there is some biochemical difference, which is, and, and results which are indicating that bias is less. Actually, when you start with the random hexamers and your DNA sample and you start your amplification, so your P29 polymerase comes, you start displacing, displacing DNA in front of it. So initially, you denature your template, and the uh, displacement is happening, and new polymerization is going on for 80 kb. So contrary to the PCR, which you have about gain between 100 base pairs and then replication of other 100 base pairs, replication of another 100 base pairs, here you have the process which is going up to 80 kb. So there is no so repetitive short-term, long, low motive, short motive amplification. And uh, at the end, the covering of the genome is quite, quite impressive, especially for the long genomes. Again, one of the examples where you want to escape tag-based bias, where you put uh, three prime end with a big sequencing, and then you're using your options. And there are different strategies, uh, different versions. Uh, all of them are at the end, uh, facing the same problem, how to amplify small quantity of template without generating bias with my amplification tools, which are primers, uh, and uh, that the signal at the end is coming really from the target. So V29 based, uh, V29 based amplification, it will give you, a, a, from few nanograms, will really give you 10 micrograms DNA. And they will say that in the medial, and they will claim that this will not affect the quality of the actual sample. Well, depending what we understand with this quality. So if you put that, let's say that you have a low quantity, and you put that low quantity of the input material, you put that on a sequencing, and you detect a huge quantity of almost, you know, extraterrestrial DNA, which is the result of these primer dimers. However, there is a way to remove that. So quantity of DNA you're generating doesn't mean that you're fine. Um, <clears throat> there are two, how to say, theories why this is happening, and they are not excluding each other. One is that there is a um, self-priming of SIGSMERS, and Japanese group um, um, Toshiro Kobori and Hirokazu, they make a very nice um, showcase um, that uh, trying to remove contaminant from V29 protein will might help. However, they use uh, ribosomal uh, ribosomal RNA six mers with the tie of bonds, and uh, I see in literature that people tried it. It's uh, it's a mystery to me. There is definitely not self priming. There is a huge quantity of DNA generated, but signal in our hand was very low, and we tried to linear DNA. I heard that. Later on, that we should do with circular DNA and doesn't work with linear DNA. And honestly speaking, I don't know, uh, but um, we couldn't make it work. However, the, the elegant method to remove contamination, if there is contamination, is presented by them. So what are advantages of the P29-based amplification? First of all, it's a single hybridization event at the beginning, and after that is displacement. So the higher processivity of the enzyme will push your amplicon for 80 kbs or over the nucleic acid content which you have in your sample. So this is automatically bringing lower error rate and minimizing bias. What is this advantage of fit 29 beta amplification? It's a question mark here, more sensitive to preparative contamination. Uh, and uh, there is a logical paradox here that um, 
we could have contamination 329, but we cannot amplify on the other kind of small fragments. And I don't know if anybody can understand that quite, quite uh, with a quite certainty. But the fact is that there is an ability to amplify a DNA or RNA with a reverse transcription when the situation is such that we have fragmented DNA, which, as I said, could be resolved by ligation upsetting. Uh, what we are doing at Jewish General Hospital at the moment, we are doing, uh, we are using FIG 29 based protocols. And uh, our protocol is able to remove artificial contamination of uh, reagents. Artificial meaning if we add into the tubes up to 10,000 molecules, long molecules, they are completely removed if we apply our protocol. Also, uh, uh, we are able to amplify small genomes with this ligation step, which was uh, presented before, in, a, in, a, in our first publications. And actually, even down to 100 base pairs could be amplified. Um, now we'll go to the two years, three years old uh, set of kits, uh, especially whole transcriptome amplification handbook, which was designed to essentially this kit was designed for um, transcription analysis. Uh, but we are aware that in, in, in real life we have RNA viruses, we have DNA viruses, and we want to find those RNA viruses, like for example, enteroviruses. So we have to be on the front line A by the end. We can start with DNA, but we should be able to detect RNA pathogens. And the way to do is to apply reverse transcription. First hints how to do that are described in this uh, whole transcript of the amplification handbook pathogen. However, the limit is 25 cells, up to 1,000 cells, and that's, that's not the option. Um, now back to intellectual property. We should stop with, with uh, patenting things which doesn't make sense. And I even don't know which, which to whom company belongs this patent, but one of the claims is that it talks about self-priming. So you, you, you are patenting essentially a new design of oligonucleotides, which is blocking self-priming, which in practice doesn't work, but you're making claims that you did it, in a, and such a claims are such a broad, and I will explain you what they mean non-complementary. This means that your oligo uh, should not have more than 70% of uh, complementary uh, bases between each other. So let's say you are PhD working in your lab with your boss or you're in academia or you're even in a small biotech and you find out how to do it and then you're blocked with this claim which is very general. Uh, um, simply this is uh, depressing and I don't even see the, the, the meaning of patents anymore uh, in a context of the present situation. Everything is shifting to over trade, uh, trade secrets. Um, I'll illustrate this case because it was a nice case of the RNA pathogen where the authors, uh, so it's very recent, uh, find and identify the antivirus, but they at the end claim that uh, the future protocol exactly have to overcome this problem to find a way how to start uh, and overcome limited started material. So conclusions. <clears throat> um, first of all, it's we have to stop self priming, minimize amplification, make sample only for events and start doing it. Uh, we start doing that even 2000. We did self priming arrest. It's very good product, but it's not perfect. And we also published our first attempt to amplify small genomes. Um, where, what is the final goal? That in an emergency, push the doctor, microbiologist, uh, uh, from possibility to certainty and to generate value, which is priceless, which is life saving. At the end, you want to identify bug and to apply the adequate therapy. That's the role. And uh, per people involved in this project was from San Justin Hospital, and they're still involved, Michael and Angie meeting again. And uh, our group of microbiologists here at the Regional Hospital, and that's it. Uh, Yves Lantan, Matthew, 
given Andre and Elizabeth McNamara. So if there are no questions, let me tell. Uh, if there are not questions, I would be uh, happy to go back to amplify those things. And I want to thank you very much on uh, offering you this, this uh, presentation. Thank you again and bye.